Welcome to the Rut to Roost podcast, brought to you by Buckeye Bowhunter. And now, your host, Josh Grunt. What is going on, guys? Back for the fourth episode of the Rut to Roost podcast. Man, it is flying by, and this is a really good one. Um, If you guys are pumped for turkey season, stay tuned for this one as well because we're going to talk about more turkey hunting stuff, but not before we introduce John Shiner, who's going to be our third co-host on the Rut to Roost podcast here. I've known John for a really long time. He's a fantastic guy. He is a hardworking, dedicated hunter. Um, You know, he's he's a little newer to the archery game, um, but he's, you know, been hunting and turkey hunting and deer hunting for a very long time. And me and Bryce are just really excited to have him on. He's going to bring a, you know, a whole nother perspective and a whole nother view of things. And uh, yeah, so with that said, we're going to get into this. We're going to do a lot of introductions. We're going to do some recaps. Stay tuned till the end because we do get into turkey hunting. We get a little off topic for a little bit, but uh, we will talk about turkey hunting setups, what we're looking for when we're setting up on a bird. Hopefully you guys get something out of this podcast and make you a little more successful this spring. With that said, hope you enjoy. Thank you for joining us again today. Uh, we're back here for the, I think this is the fourth episode of the Rut to Roost podcast. It is um, flying by. Uh, me and Bryce have been trying to pump these out as fast as we can, but uh, today is a good day, an exciting day. Uh, we got a new uh, co-host in the building. Well, not really in the building. We're doing this all virtual. John Shiner is going to join us, hopefully, for as many of these podcasts as we do, but um. We're really happy to have him here today. Um, he's been a really good friend of mine for a long time. We met at an old uh, job we used to work together way back in the day and really quickly found out we were both big time deer hunters, kind of the same way me and Bryce met. It was actually at the same place of employment, uh, believe it or not. Um, but me and John, you know, became buddies really quick. He's got some, you know, a family farm that he invites me out to every year and you know, we have a good time bow hunting and everything. And uh, John, we're just glad to have you here. Uh, you want to say a couple things or kind of introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. No, definitely happy to uh, happy to join the team. No, it's exciting. You know, it's kind of an awesome outlet. I know my wife always teases me, you know, when I'm out with buddies, you know, or a group together and if the topic comes up deer hunting you know i'm all in and <laughs> she makes fun of me that the conversation kind of sways that way but it's fun to talk about it and have an outlet and absolutely yeah mm-hmm. absolutely i gravitate towards those kind of people man like you can tell when you start talking to people about deer hunting or turkey hunting or whatever really quick you're like either like oh you're not like me <laughs> like, or you're like me <laughs> or okay you're crazy like me too i'll get along with you you know what i mean so both bryce and john i have we all share that you know disease or bug with but uh john i guess do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got your start or um when you started sure yeah uh let's see started hunting my dad got me into it maybe 10 years old i started and we we started off with small game small upland game. So squirrels, rabbits, my dad had a beagle. Um, we'd run the beagle then right about, you know, 13. He's like, all right, you graduated. Let's get the deer gun out and, uh, graduated into deer hunting. From then on, I kind of left the upland game (laughs) behind and got infatuated with the deer hunting. I've been doing that, uh, up until maybe five years ago, kind of the same time I met you Josh um and we kind of had an affinity for deer together and we talked about bow hunting and how I should do it and I had already been thinking about it but I eventually got into it and now I'm obsessed it's easy to do huh (laughs) yeah man it's it's a money pit that's for sure speaking of how you uh, how you were talking about rabbit hunting 
that's how I like, that was the first time I ever, my experience ever, I was probably seven or eight or 10 years old, something like that was rabbit hunting with my dad and we never had dogs. So I was always like the beagle. He'd be like, go jump on that, you know, brush <laughs> pile brush. and kick them out, you know, or something <laughs> like that. And then he'd shoot them and I'd go have to dig them out of the bushes somewhere or something. But it seems like, I don't know. Do you guys see that? Like that generation I feel like it's a lot. It's, it's yeah. a lost art. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, my dad, obviously, you know, this is, going back into the seventies, that's all they had for Western PA, Ohio is Upland game. And it kind of solidified that with me as I had a college buddy who I had been hanging out with and I got him into deer hunting, turkey hunting, and he worked with his dad and his dad, you know, was hearing all these stories this is back when we were single, so we were really putting in the time every weekend, you know, getting out, getting after it. Um, he, and my buddy would go back to work, and tell these stories to his dad and his dad, you know, kind of got a little jealous because he used to do upland game hunting um, and he had the same story. We ended up bringing him along and getting him going. Um, it was a fun journey getting a older, not to be rude, you know, an older guy than me. Uh, you know, an adult deer hunter um, and teaching him the ropes. And actually, you know, my buddy in college, he's got a family now. Um, his time is very limited, but um, his dad, I actually, I talk to him every week about something. And his old stories were, you know, I grew up, all we did was rabbit hunt, squirrel hunt, duck hunt. And he goes, we just didn't have the deer population um, when he was growing up to actually get into deer, which is, you know, yeah, kind of interesting. Yeah, super, super interesting. I know pheasants was a big one. My dad would tell me stories how, like, get out of class and nobody cared about property lines back then. They just grab their guns and they just go, you know, and they'd shoot a whole bunch of pheasants, a whole bunch of rabbits or whatever. But, yeah, I mean, I think my dad kill, said he killed his first deer. I think he was out of high school at that point and a little four corn it was like in the newspaper. It was like such a big deal because deer season was like a very new thing. People didn't really do it. Hmm. You know, I'm not sure when it really first came around, but he said, you know, there were not that many deer, at least in Ohio back then. It was not something a lot of people did. I watched my father kill his first deer and it was a nice eight point. He said he hunted all the time growing up behind the house. There was a big patch of woods. It's a development now. He said he hunted up back there since he was 15, 16. He'd go sit every year, never killed one. And when I started, never had luck. No, when I started hunting, what was that? I don't know, 12, 14, whatever it was. I think the second year of us hunting, he shot a nice eight point. He finally he done like the deal. <laughs> <laughs> he was happy, man. He was happy. I tried to get him to mount that thing. Awesome. He wasn't a monster or nothing, but I was like, you got to mount that. You got to mount that. And he didn't do it. That's I was cool. happy for him. I guess you're the lucky charm. <laughs> I'm not lucky charm for uh, myself, John. So you've been bow hunting for like five years or so. You said you were kind of all into gun hunting before that. I just like kind of got into gun hunting recently. I bought a 350 legend. Um, and I hear a lot of guys talking about these, you know, really into, you know, gun season and gun hunting, shooting slug guns, shooting shotguns. And, um, I guess what's like the pool of shooting a slug gun versus, like a 350 legend, like they just made those straight walled cartridges legal in Ohio. So like, you know, that gun is accurate. I could shoot that thing 150 yards. So like, I guess why would, what would it, what interests you? Cause I know, I know Bryce shoots a, a slug gun. I was just showing John the new one I just got actually before oh, we started. You know? Yeah. I showed him that wing master I bought. John, do you want to answer first? Yeah, I'll start. So really gun hunting for me now is more of a tradition more than anything else. Um, since I picked up that bow, I've fallen in love with it. Um, and I take that very seriously. Um, and really gun hunting is more of a tradition getting together with all the old guys that I grew up hunting with, um, hearing all the stories really the nostalgia of just going out deer hunting, you know, hanging out together, getting out there right after Thanksgiving, 
everybody brings their leftovers from Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. We got to get through that, you know, hanging out, hearing all the old stories that I've heard for the last 20 years, still happening, <laughs> still telling the same stories. Yeah. Still awesome. That's funny. Um, but yeah, I still have my, um, Remington 870, uh, maybe, I don't know, five years ago, I switched over to a rifle barrel off of a smooth bore with a bead. Really, I just go to have fun now, you know, since I've gotten into bow hunting, I've learned so much and really put in the time and effort, um, to get really good at it. Not to say I'm good at it to get better at it. Um, but just kind of seeing how everybody does it, you know, everybody's got their own stands. Um, scent control is a non issue. You know, my, my dad and his buddies, they still put on their bibs, you know, the night, you know, the night of, um, they'll fry their bacon breakfast and (laughs) they'll be wearing them, eat their, eat their breakfast and throw on the coat, grab the gun. Right. Don't even look at the wind. What direction Uh, the wind's going. They just ride into the woods. No, you got your one stand, you head to it. (laughs) That's fine. That's right. Yeah. So that's kind of where I've, settled in on on gun hunting um right now and where i'm at in my life i don't think i'm ever gonna well i say that now but upgrading the gun just i'd almost put forth more of my effort into my bow setups my you know ladder stands uh hang ons i'm really more into the bow hunting right now um i still do my gun hunting i still love it but um, as far as like upgrading, maybe I see myself getting a Henry or something right. like that, something fun. But here's here's a question focus. for both of you guys: one sixty with a shotgun or a one thirty five with a bow? Yeah, one sixty with a shotgun all, so. all, all day. <laughs> all right, I thought that was going to be day. a lot harder harder to answer. All right, let's say one fifty. Well, until uh, 150 with a shotgun. Do I have a 150 on the wall yet? Wall. I don't know. I don't know. Do you? <laughs> All you know. I have is guns. <laughs> yeah, you see mine too. Um, beer up there. I can elaborate off that too, though, Josh. My looks very similar. I I go for the stories, the old time tradition, the fun. That's my like vacation for the year. I mean, if I if I don't take some vacation out of state or something, I'm making damn sure I'm there for all of gun season, the entire week and two days with that first weekend. Um, it's just a lot of fun to me. It's something I don't ever want to miss after the first time I've done it. But it's also a little different for me. The way we gun hunt down there is we're on nothing but public land and we're kicking brush like rabbit hunting. So in that instance, that 350 legend is not going to really do you any good because you can't even – zoom to the half the distance I think can shoot because there's brush everywhere that deer can you can kick that thing out of a brush pile and it'll pop up 15 yards in front of it and you got to be able to hit it on the run that's where the slug barrel <clears throat> comes in handy and prime example oh of this, don't don't tell the hardcore bow hunters you're slinging lead at deer running in front of you <laughs> they'd be all up hey, in arms after this one Bryce. that's tradition man brown it's down i know that's how they had brown that's how it's they, down that's what it is it goes full circle what john said in the beginning the deer population back then wasn't as high they had to hunt like that that's why it's an old school thing they had to go kick them up because they weren't just walking past you 10 at a time in one sit you know but <clears throat> prime example of this this uh past extended season that ohio has that extra two weekends my we're doing a drive nobody i mean small group me and my buddies there was four four of us so we put three drivers on a hillside that was a nice greenbrier thicket and one on the other side it kind of like had little fingers whatever it wasn't very long my buddy in the middle comes right out of this big thicket up the hill and this doe's sitting in a bed against a big old half of an oak tree that snapped and is just looking at him boom shot it dead didn't even move They'll just you can just walk by them, so you got to be able. Well, to you don't have you don't have to put a you don't have to put a scope on one of them three fifty legends if you don't That's want to. That's very true, very true. But I don't know if they have the 
knockdown power that a 50 grain or a 50 whatever it is slug out of a shotgun has you know what i mean true that'd be a good comparison to see really i could see that becoming something in the future as these 350 legends and things get more popular as people trying different things with them so that's my take on shotguns i'll always use them just because i like to be old school like that but they do me good very cool yeah i'm just curious because I, I never grew up doing that i uh my dad he was a you know, bow hunter from the get go. And, you know, every time we went hunting, it was just kind of me and him. And then when I got 15, he was like, good luck, you know, see ya. And <laughs> get out of my good <laughs> I figured every, yeah, exactly. And I kind of figured out everything myself. So, um, I mean, he taught me a whole bunch though, but, uh, but yeah, we never had that like kind of gun, you know, season sort of deer camp thing growing up, which, I don't know. Maybe I missed out on something. Sounds like. Well, we'll get you down here to one of these. We always need more guys. There's never enough. That's for sure. My camp's always short. Uh, never enough. <laughs> I know during camp's always short on guys. Well, I swear, everybody, we're gonna get to what you came here for: turkey hunting <laughs> stuff in a minute. John, you know that was your intro, I guess. So thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully, it's gonna be us three um, together for most of these podcasts um going forward uh and john we like to kind of give a little update before we get to our topic for the day i guess about like kind of what we've been doing the last couple weeks since our last podcast and um i guess if you just want to let us know what you what you got going on what you're excited for any outdoorsy things i know um john is a, a big time he like i said earlier he's got some land up north and i mean he does the food plots the timber stand improvement all kinds of stuff so if you want to talk a little bit about that sure yeah yeah i was up uh last weekend up at the property um checking up on uh actually planted some pawpaw trees um i don't know if anybody's familiar with them but they're uh i believe they're ohio's largest native fruit fruiting tree so just out of curiosity and tree uh, I bought some and I planted those a couple weeks ago and I was just happy to see that after all the windy storms, um, they're still standing. Um, but the real reason I went out was to enjoy Easter with my family, enjoy the woods. Um, I got to get out and, uh, walk around the property. Um, I actually hung a couple of trail cams um one in particular i had one last year that i would you know set up and just looking for deer just seeing who's uh you know walking that transition line it's a uh called a fen uh swamp so a fen is typically a swamp that uh moves water throughout the year so I put I hung a camera on that last year, just seeing who's walking along that transition. And I ended up stumbling upon, it almost seemed like a roosting area for turkeys. Um, Cause I got more pictures of turkeys than I did deer. And the camera kind of overlooked uh, a high point on a knob that fell into the uh, wetland and it overlooked a fallen tree um, for whatever reason. It was like the only fallen tree within 80 yards. Um, and I got a lot of pictures of turkeys perching on that log and just fanning their wings. I don't know if it was, you know, knocking off the dew or drying out or even just stretching from sleeping all night. I was excited to get a camera out there this, you know, last weekend. Um, see what I could see, man. Hopefully a big gobbler is chasing yeah. hens or using that roosting area. Yeah, to go back, that that's awesome. So, to go back a little bit, though, I had no idea, and I think this is kind of interesting, what pawpaw trees were. I've heard of them. I thought it was from, like, the Jungle Book or something sure. until you told me about these. Yeah, and I, <laughs> I read up on them. They're a super cool tree, actually. Yeah, very interesting. They're a, a understory tree um, that typically hangs out in, like, riparian areas, so low-lying, creekside. um, there's wild ones throughout Ohio, but I just thought it was interesting. They've got a really big fruit upwards of a pound. 
Um, and they look like a big green jelly bean, but like the size of a softball. Mm. And they're out of the custard apple family. So their consistency, and granted, it, I'm speaking from research. I haven't actually tried one. You know, I just planted the trees. Let's hope this works out. But um, from what I've read, it's out of the custard apple family, um, it's got a consistency of a banana. And their flavor, when ripe, is a cross between a banana and a mango. So it's got like a real citrusy, tropical Oh, heck flavor. Yeah, that sounds delicious. They've got pawpaw. I've done a lot of research. So there's like pawpaw festivals down in southern Ohio that you can go to. But like I said, it's an understory tree. So they want to grow with minimal sun. So they want to have that shade. They want it, They're very shade tolerant. But as they grow and mature... Um, they won't start to bear fruit without full sun. So when I was doing this research, I bought these trees. I wanted to kind of figure out, you know, how do I do this? You know, how am I going to give a tree mostly shade when it's young? And then when it's time to cash in, when they're like six foot, cash in on, you know, the fruit. What I ended up doing was planting them in a full sun area. And I actually bought shade cloth. So it lets, you know, it's it holds back uh, a certain percentage of the light. So it's giving that tree shade so it doesn't get sunburnt on its leaves when it's real young. So that's the route I went. You know, I've read that you could plant it on the north side of a fence. Um, I don't have fences out there, so that was out. Or you could plant it in the woods, you know, where... It's in the understory, but once they mature and get to their, you know, six, seven foot, you know, four, five, six year old range, um, you're gonna have to cut them trees around it. And I didn't really want to do that either. So I chose to plant it in full sun and I'll shade it. I'll baby them for a couple of years and hopefully I can, you know, reap the benefits and get some yeah. do you have to, uh, do you have to like put any protection around them when you planted them or so what i read was they're pretty uh the deer typically don't like them so they won't be browsing on them um however i have read that you know deer are curious right and when you plant a little itty bitty 12 15 inch tree it's only gonna have eight leaves so if a deer comes in and wants to give it a shot, yeah. you know, <laughs> he can knock out 20% mm, of that quick, tree yeah. real fast. So I ended up caging Oh, you him. did? Yeah. I yeah, well, him. I mean. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, just. Especially up there, caution. I could see a buck. As soon as they get to, you know, two or three inch sapling, I could see a buck just rubbing them up or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And taking off half the branches or something. Um, but that's cool, man. That's cool. That's a, sure. a pretty sweet thing, you know, for the future. I mean, you know have for your kids and everything to be picking those and right but it's kind of switch gears john are you ready for you ready for turkey season man kind of mentally i'm there man i'm ready i'm excited i'm ready to rock and roll um but i will you know come clean i haven't opened up my hunting gear yet and i'm or what a week and a half out i'm excited to but i've been really really um hammering the honeydew <laughs> list <laughs> So I've got a family, got young ones. Um, so I've been hammering the honeydew list so I can, you know, go and have fun and head on out to the woods and chase turkeys. And you got to make carefree. everybody happy at home and before you can yeah, go out and have to. fun and not have to worry about it. Right. Right. I can second that too, John. I haven't done much calling yet. A little bit here and there. Definitely need to practice. Well, more. yeah, you guys, you guys still got a little time. My turkey season starts in two days very so true i have been i have been like i'm completely packed i have all my gear packed i have everything ready to go in my truck it's all sitting right here in one pile nice um yeah i'm excited man i'll be driving down to kentucky i'm leaving about noon tomorrow so um to head down to kentucky and i'll be meeting up with um my boss actually at my current job and his son and uh, we're going to see if we can roost a bird tomorrow night and then be out in the woods uh, Saturday morning and Sunday. And I'll be out there for at least a week, you know, however long it takes to kill two birds or fill my tags. And um, 
as long as I'm back home or back to Ohio by the 22nd, which is when Ohio's season's open. And uh, John and Bryce are both going to meet me somewhere down in the Wayne National Forest um, for that opening weekend, which is pretty exciting too. So that's about all I got going on. I got, um, like I said, I'm all packed up. Um, I got a bunch of turkeys on camera on my farms up here at home, you know, within 15, 20 minutes of my house, like kind of making me wonder if I really want to hunt the Wayne when I come back to Ohio. I feel like I could kill one opening morning on uh, the Frank farm. If you guys watch any of my YouTube videos, um, I got a big old Tom almost every day at like 10 o'clock noon, something like that. Walking past one of my cameras. Yeah. So, but that's about it, man. I'm just excited. I'm chomping at the bit. I, I've been practicing my calls, calling diaphragms all day, every day, like probably my neighbors are losing their minds. (laughs) Listen to me practice on my calls, but, um, But yeah, I'm ready, ready to get going, man. Ready to get this uh, roosted series started and filming, and pretty excited. What what type of terrain is that Kentucky? Yeah, have? so it's um from from what I can tell on aerial photos and what I've talked to, um, you know, the gentleman I'm going to be hunting with down there, it is very steep. It kind of seems like it's going to be the t- like topography, like the Wayne is, like steep stuff but there's a lot more fields. It looks like, like it's a lot of agriculture. So you got That's the, good. you got the topography, but you got, you don't have as much like open hardwoods. So the birds are kind of um, the way they explain it kind of, you know, a little more congregated, I guess, compared to what we would be used to hunting in the Wayne, if that makes sense. But he's got some, he's got some, uh, some private land that he's got me permission to hunt on. And then I'm going to give the Daniel Boone a try and then there's a couple different, uh, you know, smaller pieces of public within 20 minutes, 40 minutes of where I'm staying that I'll probably give a try to if I, if I, uh, if it comes to it. So, but it, the private land that he's got, man, he's been sending me pictures <laughs> all day, every day. And it's just like, dude, stop, man. You drive me crazy. <laughs> like He's got birds in these, on these cameras, like constantly. So it should be exciting. I, you know. Like I said, I'm shooting at 410, so I'm going to try and keep everything, you know, within 30 yards. We'll see how it goes, man. I'm excited, though. So, I think you'll do good. Hopefully, I just come back with a lot of content and some turkey breasts. So There you go. <laughs> Guaranteed to learn something. Yeah. Stay, <laughs> Stay humble, humble, my friend. <laughs> exactly. Stay humble. Exactly. Right? <laughs> Every time I think I got it made, knock on wood, it's like it ends up being the worst season ever. So, but... uh. How about you, Bryce? What do you got going on? Um, I know you were testing. You were testing out your gun. Yeah, I got into the woods last weekend. I tested out a five shot versus six shot with a twenty gauge. I got that new uh, twenty gauge Winchester SXP from Josh. Actually, since you want to go with that four ten, and <clears throat> yeah, I shot the five versus six shot at forty yards with the Winchester Longbeard XRs and. The six shot looked to have the tighter group that far, so going with the six shot. Bryce, you got anything else you want to talk about? Anything else you want to update? No, I'm good, man. I'm running six shot. That's it. All right. Well, I'm excited for you. Yeah, I'm I'm shooting. Um, I got Federal TSS for my 410, and then I got um, Foxtrot ammo, which is nine and a half and ten duplex size shot. So I'm excited to shoot those. Those, I mean, they patterned awesome. So um, I'm pretty confident out to 40 yards with that 410. But uh, but yeah, um, I guess let's switch gears and let's kind of talk about what everybody came for here. Let's talk about some turkey hunting stuff, guys. Yeah, let's get into it. So what I kind of wanted to talk about today, and this was kind of John's idea, was like turkey hunting setups because you know we can kind of dive into whether you're running gunning or if you're like set up in a blind um how we would do it but um i think it's kind of like the most overlooked thing when it comes to actually being successful in killing a bird is your actual setup right john what you were saying is like you could do everything right but if you can't get a shot at the bird or if you can't get the bird to come in to your setup right? Because of some kind of obstacle or something going on where you are, then it really doesn't matter how good of a turkey hunter you are. Um, it's all for naught. So I guess 
Um, let's kind of talk about that. And I, I kind of want to start out by kind of putting a scenario out there. Um, if so, and, and I'll give each of you guys, like we'll each kind of take a turn talking how we would deal with it. Um, if say we're down in the Wayne opening weekend, it's like noon, right? And we're, well, let's say it's like 11 o'clock because we, we got to stop hunting at noon that first week. Um, and we're walking the bottom of a Creek and we strike up a bird way up on the ridge, I guess. What, what would be your guys's first move? What would, what would, what would be your first thing you'd want to do? So that's a great question. And I guess why I wanted to talk about it, um, to kind of walk through the mindset of what, what are you going to do? Right. You're walking the river bottom, you hit your call and gobble, gobble, gobble right at the top of the, the hill ridge, whatever you want to call it. What, what's the move? Um, man, what do you do now? Do you cut the distance or do you get past the bird? I mean, um, I guess it depends a lot on what you're actually dealing with, like topography wise. But I guess the, the point of the question, what I'm trying, what I'm trying to get at is like, I have always had a lot of trouble calling birds downhill. And if I'm down in the bottom and that bird's up on a ridge, I guess my first thought, my first instinct is I got to get level with him at least. If that makes sense. If you guys like kind of notice that same thing or. I guess I'm so new to topography. All of my birds, I've been up in Northeast Ohio hunting swamps. So you know, I, right. <laughs> the biggest, the biggest hill I deal with is, you know, an elevation to be, change. To be honest 20 with my feet, experience, 30 feet. if I'm in the river bottom and I got them gobbling, I usually stay put. Cause they'll play very tough to get. I've had them happen where they'll still come in but they just take a very long time and they've came in quiet before in a river bottom like that. But I try to stray away from that from the start and I try to just not even get in the river bottoms <laughs> just stay up top. That's a very good point. If I'm stopping and calling and I'm, you know, mid morning, I'm running and gunning. I'm trying to stay up on top the ridges so that if I do strike mm -hmm. a bird, he's either on the ridge across from me, or he's below me or he's on the same ridge as me. And I'm already in a spot where I can make a move on him. A lot of times too, like early season, we'll be down there. There's not going to be a lot of cover on the trees. I know John, when me and you were down there last year, it was really greened up. It's going to look a lot different this year. So if you're down in those bottoms, a lot of times in a bird gobbles up on the ridge, like you're not moving, you're kind of stuck and you could sit there calling to him over and over and over. And all he's going to do is just gobble and gobble and gobble and strut back and forth and bring in every hen within a quarter mile or every hunter right. within a half a mile, you know, while, while you just sit there and watch him walk away. So that's kind of the best advice, I guess, Bryce is what you said is just to, you know, if you're running and gunning, making sure that you're, when it comes to topography, um, at least running the tops of the ridges, I guess. That's going to allow your calls to kind of reach as far as possible to begin with, right? So are you kind of playing the sight advantage game, you know, not trying to give the Tom the sight advantage? So if he's on top of the mountain, hill, whatever, he can see down and through a river bottom versus yeah, looking at a skyline up easy a though if he's looking up like that well it's it's kind of like a well-known thing that like turkeys just don't call downhill easily like it's hard to bring them downhill they don't want to come down right if they're up on top somewhere or they're on a bench somewhere they're there for a reason because they feel like it's open they can be seen for a long ways off it's a really good strutting zone and the last thing that bird wants to do is pitch off the edge of that um, top or the edge of that bench down a, you know, a 80 degree slope to come find a hen in the bottom where it's super thick and brushy and whatever. So, um, you know, being able to at least be, I guess, when I'm thinking about like sitting up on a bird, it's like the most important thing is 
how can I make it the easiest for this bird to get to me? I want him to have the least amount of effort possible to put forth to get to me, if that makes sense. Right. You know, if I'm if I'm walking a bottom and or if I'm walking flatland and like, you know, up in northeastern Ohio and I got a big river that I'm paralleling and all of a sudden a bird sounds off across the river. Um, I'm, it's very difficult to call a bird across the river or to call a bird across the gully or across a fence row or something like that. They just don't want to do it. Um, and that just goes back to the fact that like, again, we've talked about this before Bryce is what we're trying to do is the opposite of what nature, nature intended. Right, right? right. Yeah. Like those, those turkeys are gobbling because they're expecting those hens to come to them. They're in a spot that they want to be, that they feel like they can be seen by hens and whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, so you're in a weird predicament to begin with to try and call a bird in, if that makes sense. Well, let me, um, let me go back to what John said about starting in the bottom. Like, what do you do if, if you're trying to get up to meet, do you meet that bird? Do you go around the knob? What's your best escape route if you are stuck in that situation? Do you think the best situation is to half it right away if he's not coming down, or do you get, take a long route and get on top? Or I guess it depends on it depends on a lot of right? things. It depends on yeah, what I strike him up with too is a big factor, right? If I strike him up with a crow call, I feel like I got all the time in the world. I can do whatever I want, right? right. I can back <laughs> back up, turn around, walk way out the drainage get up on his level and walk all the way out the ridge and then start hen calling if I want. But if I hit him with a couple clucks and a couple yelps and he cuts me off, uh Oh boy, he's on his way. He might be coming, you know, so Scrambling. now what do I do? Exactly. Like, so, you're right. Um, it, it really <clears throat> depends. It depends on, you know, how far I can see through the woods. If it's really open, if it's thick, if I think I can call him down through there, maybe, He's up on top and there's a bench between me and him. I think I can beat him to that bench. I'm going to try and do that, you know? Um, right. Yeah. I mean, I guess ideally most of the time I'm going to try to at least back up and like get up on top, try and get up on his level and then work my way out to him if I can. Okay. Yeah. It's tough, man. And I know down in the Wayne, I've been in some situations where, you know, I've been trying to like cross a valley and a bird sounds off. And then, you know, I just drop down in the creek and I just start running, you know, and get 500, 600 yards down the creek. And then I'll cut up to him or gotcha. cut up to the top of the ridge. You know what I mean? Right. And then cut back towards him, if that makes sense. And then start calling. Um, Cause it, it's just, it's really hard to call a bird downhill. And like you were saying, John, he has the sight advantage. You know, if he's especially early season, if he's coming downhill, he can see a mile down there, right? He can see everything. Where's that hen at? You know, if you don't got a decoy set up, maybe you got, maybe you're not carrying one. Maybe you got in a pickle where you didn't think you had enough time to put one out. Um, yeah, you, you're going to have a tough time calling them in, mm -hmm. calling them downhill. So. so, so let me ask you this. So putting that scenario in reverse, mm. you're up on top of the ridge. You hit a call, whether it's a locator or a hen and he fires up and he's already halfway down that opposite ridge and he fires up. Are you going to, you know, what, what are the next steps? Are you going to try and cut the distance, get down half the hill and risk him looking up and seeing you, or are you just going to sit tight and hope that he makes his way up to you? Or I guess throw in another scenario you can back your way out and make it sound like you're going to crest the ridge and get on the backside. So you're trying to get him to come him up, right? Find you, but he's got a, you know, at the moment where he crests the top of that hill, you're right on him. You know, he's peeking his head over. And as soon as he does that, you know, you're making, you're making the shot. You know, is that the scenario? Yes, that's, that's the most ideal scenario in my opinion. That's it. Yeah, if you're if you're walking the top of a ridge, like if I'm I guess if I'm walking the top of a ridge looking for a bird, I'm probably going to be just yelping to begin with because I feel like I'm in a position where if a bird does gobble from anywhere, 
I could probably call them in from here, I guess. And in your in your um, situation, John, this bird's down in the bottom, right? Or maybe on the other halfway up the other ridge or halfway down the ridge I'm on. Um, in southern Ohio, for the listeners, if you haven't hunted down there, like these hills aren't like that big. It's not a lot of distance to cover. They're just steep and there's a lot of them, right? So um, mm-hmm. if if me, you, and Bryce are down there, that would absolutely be my first step would be, um, you know, John, you put your butt right here. Someone sacrifices and gets exactly. on the backside John, of John, you hill. put your butt right here. I want, you know, when that turkey comes up, he's 30 yards and you can blast it, blast his head, you know? So like, there's no time for him to come up and look around. Like he's just at the top, boom, done. And, I'll work my way over the opposite side calling, you know, to sound, try and sound like a bird or a hen that's not interested or going the other way. And he's like, Hey, where are you going, babe? Like come back here. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, I guess if I was by myself, um, I would just kind of do the same thing. Uh, I just wouldn't have that second caller. Right. I would sit down. I would always want to be kind of on the, far side of the ridge from him but like just mm-hmm. near that near that apex right of exactly the topography. exactly that way yeah like i said when he pops over he doesn't have any time you know to to figure out that she's not there like you just gotta keep your head locked on that horizon mm-hmm. waiting for that head to pop up and be ready to boom you know make sure the bird has a beard though before you <laughs> <Always>. shoot <laughs> But yeah, hunting that topography down there is tough. And another thing that makes it really difficult too when it comes to setups and figuring out is actually figuring out where that gobble came from. And sure. John, if you don't have a, a lot of experience, I know we didn't hear a lot of gobbles down in Southern Ohio last year. Uh, big fat zero. Mm. Um, like it is nothing like hunting flat ground. Like if you hear a bird gobble, you're like, oh. 200 yards that way let's go get them (laughs) down there in southern ohio i'm not kidding man it's like i've been in situations where i'll hear a goblin i'm like uh that way you know i'm with like a couple other guys and everybody points in a different direction and it's like no man it was this way no that bird i heard him over here he was 500 (laughs) yards he was 100 yards you know and the amount of leaf (laughs) cover changes that too right and you see that in flatland Later on in the spring, the more, um, you know, the more it seems like those birds are further and further away when they're not. Um, so that makes it tough, too. Uh, one thing I've kind of started doing whenever I do get a bird goblin, uh, especially on like the roost, like in the evening, if I've roosted a bird trying to figure out where that bird is, a lot of times um, it's hard to tell. You know, is he on the my ridge? Is he on the next ridge over? Or is he on the ridge back behind that ridge? And like I said, these these hills aren't like big. It's not a lot of distance. It's just very steep and short. They're very like, um, you know, the ridge tops are what, 25, 30 yards across if most. And then they just drop down into these big bottoms. Mm-hmm. So when a bird gobbles, like he might be on two ridges over. It's hard to tell. Um, and a good way to kind of figure that out, and this is kind of hard to explain if you don't have like a map in front of you, but I'll usually hear that bird. I'll get like a, a specific direction, like he's gobbling from the north. So then I'll start walking like, I guess, northeast or northwest, and I'll get to a point where now when he gobbles again, I can tell how far left or right he is, if that makes sense. You kind of triangulate it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And then you can kind of hopefully after a few gobbles, you're like, okay, now I know what Ridgie's on because I mean, it sounds goofy, but I've, and maybe I got bad ears too, but I have had serious trouble like actually pinpointing the actual location of where these birds are gobbling in Southern Ohio, because the, the sound just, it's just carries or is deafened by the hillside or whatever. Echoes in a hole or does something funky. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I actually, like two years ago, I watched a bird from one ridge 
and this bird was on the ridge next to me, and I could see him strutting back and forth and gobbling, but I couldn't hear him. That's crazy. Like, I'm not kidding. This bird was 250 yards away from me. I couldn't hear him at all. So it's, and hmm. I don't know. It's just, it's weird down So there. when you're, when so. you're hit trying to get this triangle, are you walking with your fan too, or are you just walking, trying to get closer to here? I know you said you carry um, a fan. Yeah. I mean, you mean like, uh, like a turkey fan. Yeah. I, yeah, like when I go down to Southern Ohio, I don't carry that on me very often. Mm. I'm not carrying any gotcha. decoys that are going to get me shot by some public land hunter. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> right, when I'm right. doing, when I'm reaping or carrying a fan like that, it's usually on private land and I really know what's Where around here. At. I'm pretty confident. Yeah. Um, right. I don't blame you there. No, I mean, just curious. I mean, usually when I'm trying to do that, it's like I'm either putting a bird to bed or I got a bird gobbling on the roost in the morning. And hopefully I'm in a position where I feel confident I can be moving around and stuff like that. Um, and I got some cover or some shadows or something to do it. in. But yeah, um, I guess that's the biggest thing. You know, I, when I'm, when I'm running and gunning too, a big thing is just making sure that if you're going to hit that hen call, if you're going to hit that slate or that diaphragm, that you're in a spot like that, you got a tree or some cover right next to you. Like a lot of guys I see, They'll call and they'll strike up a bird and they're like, oh, crap, I got nowhere to sit. What do I do? Like, I like to have that all planned out Yep, before I even call so that if that bird does gobble, boom, I know exactly where I'm sitting. I know exactly where I'm pointing. I know what where the cover is, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So having that plan in your mind is really important. Yeah. So don't don't get you yourself caught with your pants pulled down. Right. You know, you you call. And wham, he gobbles, but he's he's close. You know, he could be there within, you know, right on you in ten seconds. What are you gonna do? You know, you look around. What do you got? Don't have your decoys up uh, yet. <laughs> well, I guess the next you just kind of play a gamble. Yeah, yeah, you don't have anything. You're just walking, you're trying to cover ground, and um, so so you know, in that situation, you've got ten seconds or whatever, or maybe you prepared. You're like, all right, I'm going to call. Let's hope I've closed the distance enough to where it's going to be game time. Um, what do you guys typically look for to hide yourself, right? Are you just going to pick any tree? Are you going to pick uh, a 12-inch tree where maybe your shoulders stick out? Are you going to pick a you know a big 20-inch tree? Or is it better to you know dive into some brush? I you know, and try and yeah. hide yourself. I know down to the, in the way and you're kind of, <laughs> you're stuck with what you got, but you know, up in Northeast Ohio, where I typically go, I've got some options, you know, I can back myself up to uh, a red briar thicket and tuck myself in maybe five yards um, and give myself, you know, two lanes to shoot or, um, you know, if there's a marshy area, um, downfall trees, you know, am I trying to hide behind it? Do I want to sit in front of it? You know, these are all questions that I think we all should be asking ourselves, you know, as we're walking through the woods, you know, at any point, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody gets tired and they just want to cover ground. But when it's game time and boom, you get a gobble, you got 10 seconds. What are you looking for? Where are you going to hide? Because, you know, if you're not really thinking about that, you're not really prepared. Oh, for sure. He's going to catch you, mm-hmm. right? And then you're not going to get the bird. And you just put in 10 miles. Um, you know, it really comes down to game time. You know, what, what, do, what do you guys typically look for? Or what are you thinking about? You know, boom, he gobbles. I'm it's going for the nearest most cover um, if I have 10 seconds brush i mean ideally a tree that you can at least lean on or sit like half behind or on the side of and then have some brush around you too that's what i'm looking for ideally are you sit? are you sitting in are you sitting in front of the tree bryce and pointing at the turkey are you getting to the side of it and i like to be on the side of left shoulder i like to be on the side of the tree or in front i've been yeah 
on the side or in front. I, I don't like behind because it's too much. I feel like that's too much movement for me to get around if I'm sitting and even standing to yeah. get your gun up yeah. without, without being seen. I mean, if you're sitting, you can be as still as possible. Your back stiff, whatever. You can pull up and shoot it like a pheasant flying through the air. You know what I mean? Right away, you can yeah quick. I feel like it's slower if you're being behind the tree. Yeah, unless I was bow hunting, I wouldn't behind the tree wouldn't even be an option for me. Oh yeah. I I think I think a lot of people get the wrong idea when it comes to turkey hunting when they watch all these shows and watch all these people on TV and what their setups look like. Um I was just watching not to pick anybody out. I was just watching a, a YouTube channel and I don't know. Did, Ohio must be different, man. These guys were in like Alabama or something, and there was like four of them walking around, and they all just like sat right in front of these like two trees with cameras and mm-hmm. all this stuff, and all these birds just walked right into them. Like I have never had that. Turkeys, to me, my experience are just like you can do everything right right you can everybody practices all their calls they buy all this awesome camo and their guns and blah 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 blah. but like really what you're trying to do is like make that turkey think that there's like nothing wrong because the the the, if that turkey gets a whiff of like oh something isn't right in this scenario something looks weird he's gone right Mm -hmm. so and me self filming and carrying camera gear too, I got to be a little more, I guess, proactive about thinking like, okay, can I sit here? Can I sit there? I carry some camo netting with me um, that I think helps me out a lot too. That I drape over top of my tripod. I'll drape over my legs, um, but usually I want like the biggest, widest tree I can find so that it's like hiding my shoulders, so that I'm not like skylined on the left or the right of it. I guess. And then I usually try to get as low as possible. So like, if that makes sense, like I'll slump down so that like only my shoulders are kind of coming up the tree and I'm really low. So when that bird walks in, like, I just, I don't know what I I look like a stump or I look like just roots coming up the side of the tree. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other thing I try to look for a lot too is, um, maybe there's, a downfall out in front of me or some thick stuff out in front of me that that bird's got to work through or come around. Um, if there's a lot of wide open stuff between me and that bird, I mean, I guarantee you he's going to get hung up and he's not just going to walk right in. So it's kind of like deer hunting where if you're calling to a deer out in the middle of a field, that deer's just going to stand there and be like, okay, well, where's the deer, you know, looking for you. But if, if you got some thick stuff around you and you call to a deer and that deer can't see, so he knows he's got to come looking for it, that you're going to have a lot better shot. I think the same thing with turkeys, right? I don't want like this wide open, you know, woods in front of me. I want some ground cover. I want some things hiding me. So that bird feels like he's got to come weaving and ducking and diving through stuff to look for that hen. You know what I'm saying? Um, cause when I'm hunting public land, when we're down in Southern Ohio, we're not going to be carrying decoys with us really, you know, and, uh, making him come look for me is, I guess, you know, if I got maybe, maybe 20, 30 yards, I just need a couple, you know, shooting lanes, I guess, if that makes sense mm-hmm. to where I think he might come popping through, stick his head through to look for me. But when it comes to hiding big tree, I don't really want a lot of brush because I'm trying to get film, I guess. And if you got a lot of brush, it's hard to focus and get, you know, pretty footage of turkeys. That's where that netting comes in. So I'm sitting down. I got a big tree. I'm getting as low as possible. I'm putting that tripod setting pretty darn low. Um, I got my gun sitting on my, my knee and, uh, I, my tripod, my, my camera arm, it's got a pretty nice, uh, what do you call it? Like remote. So I don't have to do a lot of movement. I don't have to reach very far to control my camera and everything. Um, and I'm just going to kind of rely on that netting, rely on my camouflage. Um, I've really taken to leafy camo over the last few years, um, to kind of combat having to have a more open setup, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, and I feel like I, I really like it. I feel like it's worked out pretty well, but, um, but yeah, that's kind of what I'm looking for, I guess, if that makes sense. 
what are you looking for, John? Anything different? No, it's, it's, you know, it's a constant battle and that's why I kind of wanted to bring it up. Um, I feel like every time I've had success, it's always been in a situation where, you know, the, the turkey's actively searching for me, but he has to work through something. And every time I've gotten him, it's always been like a, <gasps> uh oh, moment, you know, and boom, it's over. You know, if he's got time to really analyze what he's getting himself into, you're going to have a lot harder of a time. And I feel like that's kind of where birds get hung up. You know, I've got an acre and a half food plot that I run full, you know, throughout the entire year. And I've always got food out there and the turkeys will still come out and hit it. But if I'm set up on the other side of the food plot and I get him gobbling and he's coming from the other side, he poke, you know, he could, you could see him He pokes his head out and scans the field. If he doesn't see anything, he's turning around and not coming in. So you got to, it's almost like I got to catch him on the side of the field where he's coming to catch him in the woods, you know, where he's got that. Oh shit right. moment. And it's too late. You know, it's exciting and fun, but you know, if you don't play that game, if you don't think it through, mm-hmm. that's where, that's going. where it really pays. If you do get caught in a situation like that, to have an extra guy or two with you, make their ass right. get up and yeah, definitely. <laughs> sneak over the hill and keep calling and bring that yeah. bird closer. But I got a pretty good example of what you were talking about though, John, last year, um, I was hunting on a buddy's farm with him and we were calling to a bird all day, man. It was like all morning for probably two hours. This bird was gobbling. He must've been henned up. We assumed. Um, and then we watched him cross the power line back behind us and pop into the woods. We actually had decoys out, out in the middle of this field. Um, but there was a kind of a rise out in the middle of the field and we didn't really think it out. And when we set the decoys up, we put it on this side of that rise, right? Well, we're sitting there and about 120 yards away, I watched this Tom just pop out in the middle of the field. And that rise is between him and those decoys. So he can't see the decoys. So they were worthless pretty much. But he stood there for probably 10, 15 minutes. It seemed like the longest time ever. Never went in a strut. He just was standing like super erect with his head as high as he could, just looking because he knew there was a hen calling over there, but he didn't see her. So he just stood there waiting. Where's she at? Where's she at? When's she coming? And I didn't want to call because like literally I felt like we were making eye contact with this turkey from 120 yards away. So we were just being quiet, you know, and he got to the point about 10, 15 minutes. He just turned and right back in the woods and he was gone. And that is the experience that I have with turkeys most of the time. It's very rarely you're going to pull a bird in across the field like that if he can't see what he's coming to, right? If he doesn't see a hen, um, it's just it's just very difficult to – it's very difficult to trick them into that. They, they know something's up. You know, they're stupid animals, but they're really good at surviving, and they know when something's – they know when something's fishy, right? Mm-hmm. It's fresh – so frustrating, right? You know, you, <laughs> you want to set, have your set up, you know, you want to get, get yourself in your blind and, you know, get your canteen of coffee out, kick your feet up, eat your snack, yeah. eat your snacks, you know, and just call and they're just going to come out and run up to your setup. I'm so sick of watching, you know, shows on TV where they do that. And I'm like, man, it's just not realistic for me. Cause I've given that a try for years and I've yet to capitalize on it. It's like, you gotta, I don't know, put in a little extra effort. You know, it's not just sitting in a blind with a Jake and a hen. And he's well, that was going to be my last, that was going to be the thing I can ask. And we've been, we've been talking for an hour and 12 minutes, so we can wrap it up here soon. But um, we've been talking about running and gunning and, you know, yeah kind of being on the move do you guys i guess john you kind of answered it have you ever had success i've given it a shot i've tried it hasn't worked out for me um and granted you know maybe it's where i hunt it's 
the pressure that's put on the birds around me. Um, but setting up a blind, throwing out some decoys, drinking my coffee typically doesn't work out for me. You know, not to say it doesn't work, but <laughs> not on my farm. I've had it work, but it was on a pristine private land spot with food plots in Southern Ohio that butted up to one of the biggest public land wildlife areas in the state. That's where it worked out of a blind for me. But John, just like you said, when they get pressured or something or end of the season, or we kill one first opening day, then the rest of the time on that property, you got to go run a gun because they're not, they're not going to be dumb. All all of them aren't going to be dumb twice. You know, how often are you going to be on pristine private property like that? That's made for turkeys, not often. So, well, John, you got to see his video. Bryce has like the most awesome video <laughs> you've ever cool seen one. of a giant bird strutting right into decoys. It looks like it was like straight off of like the bone collector or something. Man. Running away cool from video. the hen yeah. to go destroy wow. a jig decoy. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> My buddy videoed it like on an wow. iPhone. Gave it a couple of clucks and he turned and that was it. Yeah. Yeah, put it in it's our cool put one. it in our group chat, John. Or yeah, I'll go find it. I don't, I don't have any problem with hunting out of a blind. Um, I'm either. probably going to do a fair share of it uh, when I'm in Kentucky this week because the the gentleman I'll be hunting with um he's got a lot of blind setups right, and I think that's how they prefer to hunt down there. So, um, but to me, if I got to pick one or the other, I mean, I just I'd much rather be running and gunning and put my butt against a tree man it's just like turkey hunting it's just it feels like that's the way you're supposed to do it right you know i agree um yeah so it really gets but the adrenaline going it is good for filming i'll tell you that that's if you want to sure. film an awesome beautiful turkey hunt you do it in, from a blind that's for sure you know nobody's getting like world-class turkey hunting footage self-filming <laughs> while they're running gunning i promise right. you that um but i'll do that when i'm but yeah, old so. and gray but to kind of move on, I dude, I'm so excited to get down to Southern Ohio and do it's a, gonna be sweet. Do a three man hunt, man. It's going to be uh, exciting. You know, we can put our heads together and see if we could trick a couple of these uh, thunder chickens into making the wrong move. I've and... never done anything with <laughs> wild game down there in the Wayne. This will be my first time. I've done nothing but work down there, so. I'm excited. Yeah, man, I'm pumped. I can't wait. I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping I got a couple birds on the ground or some film with some couple birds at least before I meet up with you guys. But uh, yeah, it's gonna be fun, man. I'm, I'm excited about it for sure. So my goal going into any hunt is just don't get skunked or fish. Whatever you're doing, hopefully we just don't get skunked. <laughs> Nothing worse. Uh, I think, uh, I think me, me and John. Yeah, my my expectations <laughs> from last year are <laughs> rock bottom. I think that's good. So, You're saving gonna, yourself some sorrow. <laughs> if we get something to gobble, oh, if we shoot. get something to gobble, let hey. me tell <laughs> let me it's tell you this story. Year. Then we'll wrap it up. So Bryce, last year last year we were all three supposed to go. Bryce broke his foot like an idiot the week before, two days before turkey season opened. Yeah. Shattered it. Um. So me and John go down there, and the year before, you guys can go watch my YouTube videos. It was on fire, man. Like, it was crazy how much fun and action I had. So I just kept telling these guys. Every every pull-off, you're hearing a gobble. Every pull-off, we turn yep. the truck off. Come on, John, <laughs> yep. come on down. We'll, we'll shut the truck off. You'll have three birds <laughs> gobbling. All right, Oh, man, I it. talked it up for a month. <laughs> I had John thinking we were walking into, like, a – like just shoot World fish War in the barrel. Three against turkeys. We may be done in the first two hours out of our three day hunt. Yeah. And uh, we later. ended up, we were there. For, yeah. We were there for two days, I think two and a half days. And how many gobbles we hear, John? <laughs> it was crazy. We, we ran into other hunters Nine. who said they've been there for a week before us. Haven't heard a single thing. So, so the best story we ran into these two guys, uh, they're from South Carolina. And they actually have a cool little thing going on. You know, it's a bunch of family, you know, family, cousins. And they were explaining to us that they did a turkey tour. So they start off their season in South Carolina. Uh, I believe it was four of them. 
and they for 10 years running they they'd all tag their bird in south carolina then they'd come on up hit west virginia all tag out west virginia then they run over to southern ohio and tag out there then they'd run over to I believe it was indiana or illinois and finish up their little tour and head on home so all in all it was maybe I don't know, 10 days or so, eight days, a little over a week, week and a half. And uh, these guys um, were saying that the most they had ever spent in these last 10 years in Southern Ohio was a day. Wow. In Southern Ohio. And they'd be off, off to the next, off to the next state. And we had asked the guys, you know, how was your day? How was everything going? He goes, horrible. We're like, what do you mean? He goes, I, I hadn't heard one for days now. I go, days? You just told me that most you've ever spent was one day, dude. And he goes, no, days. We're on day five today. I go, whoa, you know, you're burning up your turkey tour. He goes, we're not going to leave a tag hanging. He goes, we're going to keep grinding. Wow. So that just kind of speaks to how last year was um, down there. So, you know, Josh, you're not alone and you know, mm. talking it up and having it not pan out. Yeah. Crashing I mean, here's, over. here's all I'll say is last yeah. year and the year before there was a higher than average pulp production, according to the Ohio DNR. So we should have a bunch of Jake's running around at least. Um, if you guys aren't opposed to shooting Jake's, I know I probably won't be, <laughs> uh, I'll probably slam a Jake if she, if it gives me an opportunity. I know last year I had an opportunity at Jake and I passed on it and I'm regretting it at this point. So, um, but there should be more Jake's running around at least, and maybe more two year olds. And because not a lot of people were successful last year, there should be more birds in general, um, than last year. So hope, I mean, hopefully it's better than last year. I don't know how it could be worse. So, I mean, if it's worse than last year, you're just going to let two guys down. So that's your shoulders, not mine. <laughs> Whatever. We'll have fun. We'll have fun. We'll drink beer. Yeah. We can only hunt till noon anyways. So, right. I mean, the afternoons will be full of bring your fishing rods and shenanigans, you know, scouting. And yeah, we'll do whatever. It'll be fun. We'll get food and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, so yeah. go put birds, go uh, roost birds every evening. That'll be fun. Uh, yeah, it'll be fun. Mm-hmm. Well, you guys ready to wrap it up then? We've been talking for a while, yeah. man. Take a look at those Airbnb things. I'll take a look at them. We'll we'll, uh, we'll get that all squared away here tomorrow or Saturday or something. Okay. Cool. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining, guys. Appreciate you coming, John. Glad to have you, man. Um, yeah, it was a good one. Yeah, I'm man. excited to be here, man. So thank you guys for listening. As always, uh, we really appreciate you joining us. Make sure you uh, follow us, like us, subscribe, whatever platform you're listening to. It really helps us out. Um, Make sure you give me a follow on YouTube, uh, Buckeye Bowhunter. Uh, Follow me on TikTok, Instagram. But, uh, yeah, with that said, appreciate you guys, and uh, we'll see you guys on the next one. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.